everyone, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is Virus Watch, the weekly video report on what's happening in the amazing world of viruses. Today, we are going to explore the relationship between Zika virus infection and the birth defect known as microcephaly. This is a condition where a baby's head is significantly smaller than expected, and it's often due to injury to the brain. The recent increase in the number of cases of microcephaly in Brazil and Colombia has been linked to infection with Zika virus. Several case studies have shown the RNA genome of Zika virus in infants with microcephaly who died shortly after birth or in miscarriages. In a study conducted in Rio de Janeiro, of 88 pregnant women who had a rash in the previous five days, 72 of them tested positive for Zika virus by polymerase chain reaction. Fetal abnormalities were detected in 12 of the 42 Zika virus positive women, that's 29%, and in none of the Zika virus negative women. I'm convinced that Zika virus causes microcephaly in humans, but it would be valuable to have an animal model to study how the virus crosses the placenta and how it damages the fetus. As with many questions about Zika virus, answers are coming very rapidly, and three different groups have now developed mouse models for studying this problem. Investigators from the Chinese Academy of Sciences injected a Samoan isolate of Zika virus in utero into the brain of embryonic day 13 and a half mice. The virus replicated mainly in neural progenitor cells, and at five days after infection, brain size was reduced compared with uninfected litter mates. Infection of neural progenitor cells disrupted their normal differentiation program, which leads to the production of mature neurons. In the infected embryos, the expression of genes that have been previously associated with microcephaly was reduced. The authors of this study conclude, quote, these effects are likely to account for microcephaly in human fetuses or newborn babies. In a different approach, a group from the University of Sao Paulo intravenously infected pregnant mice, not fetuses, as in the previous study. Here they infected the mother with a Brazilian Zika virus strain. Zika virus was detected in many tissues of newborns, especially in the brain, and newborn mice displayed overall reduced growth, cortical malformations, and reduced cortical cell number and cortical layer thickness. These are all defects that are associated with microcephaly in humans. The authors also found that the ability of Zika virus to cross the placenta was dependent on the strain of mouse that was used. It's possible that in humans, the development of Zika virus-induced birth defects is also determined by the genetics of the mother and the fetus. The authors of this study suggest that human-to-human -human passage of Zika viruses for the past 60 years has led to a strain that can cross the placenta and infect the fetus. This idea is supported by their finding that a Brazilian Zika virus strain replicates in human brain organoids. These are three-dimensional models of the human brain made from human stem cells. They also observe greater morphological abnormalities and a reduction in size of the organoids compared with effects caused by infection with an African strain of the virus. Furthermore, they find that an African, but not a Brazilian Zika virus strain, replicates in chimpanzee organoids. However, they don't address their hypothesis directly by determining in their mouse model whether an African strain of Zika virus can cross the placenta and infect the fetus. Remember, the African strains emerged earliest, and then they passed from human to human, leading to the Asian virus isolates. A third report from Washington University provides insight into how Zika virus might cross the placenta. In this model, immunocompromised pregnant mice are infected subcutaneously in the foot pad with a French Polynesian Zika virus strain at embryonic days six and a half and seven and a half. The embryos are then sacrificed seven or eight days later. 
No microcephaly was observed, but virus was detected in the head of the fetus. Replication was also detected in the placenta and is accompanied by placental damage. Infected placentals are smaller, they have damaged blood vessels, and they display evidence of cell death and virus replication in various types of trophoblasts that make up placental tissues. In contrast, the related Flavivirus virus, dengue virus, did not replicate in the placenta or in the fetus. This result shows that microcephaly is specific to Zika virus. These observations suggest that Zika virus can cross the placenta and move from the maternal blood into the fetus. The authors conclude, quote, the cellular and ultrastructural evidence of Zika virus infection in trophoblasts and fetal endothelium suggests that maternal viremia leads to compromise of the placental barrier by infecting fetal trophoblasts and entering the fetal circulation. Together, these three reports provide conclusive evidence that Zika virus can cross the placenta and cause fetal defects in mice, and they provide models to understand the biology and pathogenesis of infection. Frankly, I'm astounded at the unprecedented, rapid, and frequent publication of new research results on Zika virus biology and pathogenesis. This phenomenon reflects the willingness and the ability of large and mature groups of investigators from diverse fields, not just virology, but neurobiology and cell biology and others, to tackle a new problem and make rapid progress. This is the beauty of science. I predict that we'll learn more about Zika virus in the next year than we have about any other microbe in a similar period of time. That's Virus Watch for May 18th, 2016. If you'd like more in-depth discussion of all these stories and much more, check out the podcast This Week in Virology at microbe.tv slash twiv. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and I'll see you next week.